spent on a short summer course getting information from the college receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Sorry to keep you waiting. <laughs> OK, here's the information you need. On the first page, there's some info about the college, the facilities, the courses on offer, etc. Uh -huh. Then, on these blue pages here, there's an outline of the social activities. You see there, OK? Yes. Now, this part of the booklet here, the yellow pages, that's the main programme starting at 9am tomorrow. 9am, OK. So all the new students will be gathering in Herville Hall at nine o'clock. Uh, sorry, where? Herville Hall. I'll spell it for you. It's H-E-R-V-I-L-L -L, and then H-A-L-L -L for Hall, of course. It's the big white building by the entrance. OK, I've seen it. Right. Anyway, you'll be in there for an hour. First, the Director of Studies will explain the various courses we offer and the requirements for them. Then for the second half hour, the social organiser will tell you more about the social programme and Saturday excursions. Is that all clear? Um, yes, I think so. Then where do I go after that? Ah, yes, OK. After the talks in the hall, there's a break. And then at quarter to 11, go to classroom 4 to have a placement test. Quarter to 11. This placement test is to find my level in English? Exactly. Then, after the test, all the new students are invited to a special welcome lunch. In the cafeteria? No, no. Not for the welcome lunch. It's in a restaurant near the school. An Indian restaurant. Oh, OK. I don't think I've ever tried Indian food. Do you like spicy food? Uh, yes, I do. Then you'll love Indian. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So where's the Indian restaurant? Don't worry, it's really easy to find. Have you got that map I gave you? Uh, this one? Yes, that's it. See here, the main entrance to the school? Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, don't go out of there. Oh. There's a smaller entrance here, round the back. Oh yes, I see. OK, so you go out of there, past the phone box, and then turn right into this road here, the one that goes along the side of the park. Mm -hmm. You'll see a supermarket on the left, and then it's just after that on the right. Uh -huh. It's quite a big place. You can't miss it. OK. And one more thing. Is there a post office near here? Post office? Oh, yes, of course. Just the other side of the park. Go through the middle of the park and it's there by the park entrance. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Oh, there's a good cafe near here too. Very popular with the students. Just there. You go out of the main entrance into Varley Road, then turn left at the bank and it's at the end of the street. They do amazing coffee. That's great. Thanks very much. No problem. Enjoy your course. Thanks again. Bye. That is the end of part one. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, we certainly have a busy day ahead of us, so let's get started, shall we? You'll find a map of the museum with the itinerary I've just handed out. The museum's our first port of call, so uh, let's have a look at the map now. The door on the right of the entrance hall leads into the gift shop and ticket centre. Once we pick up our entrance tickets, I'd ask everyone to deposit their bags and coats in the cloakroom, which is located towards the back of the gift shop and ticket centre. If you want to pick up an information leaflet, you can approach the information desk situated along the right-hand side. Now, once you come back into the entrance hall, the door on the opposite side to the gift shop leads into the art gallery. There is a special exhibition on there at the moment which is not to be missed. If you continue on up the entrance hallway, that leads into the main exhibition centre. At the back left-hand side, there are some toilets. Beside the toilets, you'll find the 3D theatre. I strongly recommend that you make time for the 30-minute presentation in the theatre. It is well worth a viewing. Running along the right-hand side of the main exhibition centre is the Modern Art Studio. Here, not only can you view some of the most famous works of the 20th century, but you can also sit in on a workshop run by a local artist. So, that's the Art Museum. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next on the itinerary is the aquarium. Depending on how long we spend at the museum, we might have to give this one a miss. It's not what I'd call a highlight of the day, but it would be a shame if we didn't get to see it, as it's en route to the Solheim Country Club, where we're booked in for lunch at one o'clock. Originally, we had planned to stop off at the Milltown Winery afterwards, but we've had to scrap that plan, otherwise we'd never get to the zoological gardens before closing time. We have pre-booked the gardens and must be there by 2.30, so no dilly-dallying please after lunch. Straight back onto the bus. The gardens close at 3.30, so we've an hour there which should give us ample time to look around. Time allowing, we'll stop off at the famous Stout Brewery after that, if traffic isn't too heavy, and we're in Lincoln before 5. If not, we'll head straight for the National Concert Hall, where you're in for a real treat of an evening, with a performance from the world-renowned cellist, Andrei Borovsky. 
we have to be in our seats by 6.30 sharp. After that, it's back to the hotel for the night where a buffet meal will be waiting for us at half eight, or whenever we get back. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture about the Miner's Hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good evening and welcome to the Minor Hotel. We are pleased to have you as our guest. I will give you a brief information session to tell you everything you need to know to make this a pleasant stay. The Minor Hotel was built in the 1850s, during the Gold Rush period, also nicknaming our state the Golden State. People from all over the country and even from other countries came to seek their fortune here in these hills, creating cities overnight. In this city, many gold rush hotels soon opened up. This particular hotel was built in 1851, but was destroyed during an earthquake. It was rebuilt in 1995 to recreate the feel of the gold rush, complete with articles and actual photographs from during the 1850s. Our hotel is divided into two buildings, one called the Gold Tower, and the other is named the Fortune Tower. You will be staying in the Fortune Tower on the 25th floor, complete with great views of the city. Your room is the best room in the hotel, complete with private living room and hot tub. Here is your room card. On the card it will say FT, meaning Fortune Tower. On the bottom of the card it will say 2515, the 25 stands for the 25th floor, and the 15 stands for the 15th room on that particular floor. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. There are emergency exits in both towers of the hotel. They are located on the south side, opposite the elevators. Please use these in case of a fire or other emergency. We have some special events happening this week. Our Miner's Diner is offering a special Miner's Buffet dinner this Friday and Saturday for only $20 per person. This special includes all food, not including drinks and alcohol, and shows for the night. The buffet will be available from 5 to midnight. Because of the historical significance of our hotel, there are some special rules. The first rule is that there is no smoking allowed anywhere in the building, not even in your own room. This is not only to ensure the safety and health of our guests, but also the furniture and pictures can be easily damaged by smoke and other harsh treatment. Please remember that there are items of furniture over a hundred years old here, so respect the rules by not smoking. Secondly, please do not take pictures using a flash of any of the drawings and paintings in the rooms or hallways as they are old and fragile. 
We are doing our best to preserve a national treasure, so please help us in doing so. Lastly, you will only have one set of towels and bed sheets per three days. This is to conserve the water supply, as there are frequent droughts this high up in the hills. If there are any further questions, the staff of the hotel will be available to answer your questions. In the event that no one is able to answer your questions, I will also be available from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day in the concierge. I hope you enjoy your stay here with us. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 44 and 45. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided, and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors, such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well... Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard 
and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So that's a very different story from the early research. So what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Feel the blood creeping up from the heathens Got will, got fight, got pride, got reason If they wanna go eat, then you know I'm gonna feed them If you're coming for me, hope you're ready for a demon I got eyes in the back of my head I'm seeing Take me for granted and you know I'm leaving I'ma take what's mine with the webs I'm weaving I could take this crap from seeing to believe